Thank you, Allison. It is uh, such a great honor uh, to be here, and it's so exciting. Uh, you got some sense from that video of why those of us who have been strong supporters of ASF are so delighted to be here at this fifth anniversary celebration. For me, as Allison just mentioned, uh, as a funder, spending 1.5 billion, that seems like a lot of money, but in fact, the numbers are going down. The federal government is spending less relative to inflation each year on biomedical research. And so it is more important now than ever that groups like ASF have stepped forward, especially for this new cohort of brilliant young investigators, graduate students, postdocs, who are our future, who are really going to solve the problems for us in the future. And yet, at this very moment, the NIH no longer has the resources that it needs to have to support this next generation. And so uh, from my perspective, to have the Autism Science Foundation say that's where we want to put our focus, that's where we want to make a difference, that is spectacular. So for me, thank you. You are one of my heroes, and I mean that in the deepest sense of the word. What I wanted to talk about actually has to do with the second part of, uh, as Allison said, my role, which is as the chair of the Interagency Autism Coordinating Committee, a task that I've been uh, proud to have for the last uh, 12 years. And in that time, I've had a um, sort of a central seat at an, what I think are historic changes in the science of autism and to watch the enormous progress over that time, and also uh, to watch um, the evolution of the community uh, of families, of scientists, of advocates. Um, and I'm not sure actually the way I describe this that community is quite the right word. Uh, and not least, not in the sense that we would say the community of, that works on cystic fibrosis or type 1 diabetes or multiple myeloma. This is an area where, as I hope um, to describe in the next few minutes, Sometimes it feels like we're not so much one community as uh, four different kingdoms in which in each of these kingdoms there's a very different sense of what's the problem and what is autism, whether it's an illness, an injury, an insight, or an identity. And over the next few minutes I want to unpack each of those and give you a sense of why I think this poses a particular challenge for this field, a challenge that I must say we don't experience in most other areas of biomedical research. To the extent that autism is, a, is an illness, um, I think what we can say is that view is that this is a neurodevelopmental disorder. It's a disorder in which we have tools like neuroimaging that can potentially provide new diagnostics and tools like uh, modern genomics, which could give us insights into new treatments and new targets. And as you think about this, you can begin to put together some of the best current technologies we have for brain development, including the spectacular report out this week on the way in which the, um, the genome gets expressed in the developing human brain, taking us into places we never thought we'd be because it looks very different than the way the genome gets expressed after birth. That's what this particular picture is about. It ultimately takes us to the, 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 the vision, the goal of can we have a cure, just as Joe Buxbaum said in the video. Autism as an injury is something quite different because there what you're thinking about is that this is really a response to an environmental insult of some sort. Children with autism are the canaries in the coal mine and they may be telling us about something that um, is important relative to climate change, relative to environmental factors. The fact is we don't know many of those yet there are real teratogens, that is, there are real chemicals that if women are exposed to them in the second trimester will result in autism at a very, very high rate. So we know this can happen. And we know that prematurity, especially extreme prematurity, can have as much as a threefold increase in risk. So these are real factors. But the extent to which they tell us deeply about the whole range of autism is questionable because it's been so difficult to actually identify what those environmental factors might be more broadly. 
In fact, the reality is that there may be as many as some 80,000 factors in the environment that could be toxicants, and we've only begun to study these. We don't have here the kind of high-throughput technologies that we have for genomics and the kinds of tools we have, for instance, for brain imaging that are giving us such great insights in that previous venture that I talked about as autism as an illness. Nevertheless, important to keep this in mind because here the goal is prevention. It's identifying something in the environment that you could change that would actually turn the tide and reduce the prevalence rather than just trying to come up with treatments and cures. What about the insight piece? Well, this is one in which autism really is mostly a window into trying to understand the social brain, something that has fascinated neuroscientists for a long time. But with the advent of the tools we have today, we can begin to localize particular circuits and also particular molecules in the brain, brains of mammals, brains of humans, that seem to be critical for social cognition, for how we recognize faces, how we decide to look at the eyes rather than the mouth, how we decide to engage in social interaction, what we call social motivation sometimes, and also how we have the ability to retrieve social information and use it uh, to good effects. And of course here, the goal is something quite different. This is about the attempt to understand something fundamental about how our brains grow and how they function on a very important dimension. Finally, what about the identity piece? Well, here we're talking about autism as a disability. Autism as a disability has gotten increasing interest in the last few years as particularly people on the spectrum have become self-advocates and through peer support and through the advocacy that they've been able to do have really empowered themselves to be able to make great progress. In fact, one of the, I think, great uh, contributions of this is to help all of us remember that the goal isn't simply to reduce or change symptoms. It's to improve functioning and, and to get better functional outcomes. So here again, we've got this very different perspective on what the problem is and what's the goal. And here the goal really is about not so much cure or prevention, it's about inclusion and finding a way for people on the spectrum to be treated and to be successful in anything, to be treated as anybody else would be and to be successful in whatever endeavor they choose. So here uh, we, we often hear these comments like, don't cure autism now or nothing about us without us. Uh, Andrew Solomon did a brilliant job of capturing this sentiment in the book that he wrote last year, Far From the Tree, describing both the challenges but also the opportunities in embracing autism as an identity. So as we think about these, um, these four very different perspectives, uh, which have their own language and their own technologies and actually you know, quite different goals, we also realize that in each case, there's a very different set of what the needs are, whether it's the biomarkers for being an illness or the predictors and preventive interventions for the injury, the, the way that we can begin to map the connectome, this, the wiring diagram of the brain for those who do social neuroscience or taking this on as a civil rights issue and fighting for services and inclusion if identity is the challenge. I think for us, and with us I mean everybody in this room and the people that we love, in some ways um, there is truth to all four of these perspectives. And the difficulty has been to bring them together in a unified way that allows us to both listen to each other and to work together for social change and for scientific progress. There has been enormous progress, but there's also been enormous conflict and tension. And I must say that I can tell you about great scientists who have said to me, um, I have a lot to offer, particularly in areas like um, imaging and genetics, but this is a community I don't want to deal with. It's too conflicted, it's too difficult. And there are many communities where that is just not the issue. So I think we have to take a look at this as a community, and I mean that as creating a community that says, are there some shared interests? Certainly we can all agree that there are, there's a greater need for services, a greater need for understanding, a greater need for recognition of adults on the spectrum. That there are many areas 
of shared need and shared interest and shared opportunity. And I think it behooves all of us to figure out where are those areas and what can we do. It's also, at the same time, probably helpful for us to consider that maybe there really are at least four different kingdoms or four different, and maybe more than four, disorders involved here. And that maybe what we should be talking about is not autism, but the autisms. Uh, and that in fact, there are people who may be more in this illness kingdom, those who have more of an injury, more for whom identity is actually a better approach to the struggles that they're having at whatever particular time. And maybe one of the ways forward is to recognize that in this area, perhaps more than in type 1 diabetes or cystic fibrosis, we really need to sort of break this apart, deconstruct it to some extent, and think about actually quite different approaches to what is not a single problem, but is a multitude of problems. And I think the way to get to that point gets us back to where we started. It's going to be the science. That science has a way of helping us to understand when is it one problem, when is it four problems. And it helps us to identify where we can actually make the most progress with each of these perspectives. And one of the great things about this foundation is its willingness to say, as you heard in the video, we're gonna keep a very high bar, that we are all about doing the best science for the greatest impact. Uh, and that is, for all of us, a spectacular gift, and one that I think we need to embrace. And it is one place where whichever of those kingdoms you may come from, you can decide, there is something in this for me, because science does provide a bridge and ultimately provides the deepest level of understanding, which is, after all, one of the things that we're going to need if we are to create a single community that has the greatest impact. So I'd like to finish by wishing you a happy birthday, Autism Science Foundation. I can't wait for your 10th anniversary, and I hope I'm here for that. And I know when that time comes, this will even be a larger room with more people cheering you on, Allison. And I suspect at that point, will have even more spectacular science to point to, largely because you've reached out to focus on some spectacular young people who are going to change the world for all of us. Thank you. I think from that perspective, which is a lot of where I think many of the people in this room are focused, we have an opportunity to identify what I would call biomarkers, ways of diagnosing autism much earlier, getting um, ways of intervening much earlier, and perhaps, just as we would for cystic fibrosis or type 1 diabetes, actually reducing the prevalence and reducing the disability. So it is a, a great, great place to focus in the short term. Maybe I need another I for that. I'm not, I'm not sure. That might be, maybe the I there is insolvency. Is that, a, I guess that's an I. So the, um, the, the fact is that there's a tremendous enthusiasm for biomedical research broadly, not just in autism, but around, uh, around everything that the National Institutes of Health does, which is the federal investment in, in science, in, in biomedical science and research. Um, that said, uh, even though that enthusiasm is from Republicans and Democrats, from the House and the Senate, what we were told just in the last two weeks at our annual congressional appropriation hearings was, um, we love you, but we have no money. So I, you know, I think that um, there is value in expecting more from the federal government and in advocating that this is, a, after all, um, an investment, not a cost. It's an important investment to make against future costs. Um, but I think we have to be realistic that the, um, at this point in time, Congress is looking at a very difficult fiscal situation, and they don't see an easy way to free up a chunk of funds for autism or any other medical problem. Uh, and they're probably going to do a little bit 
better than last year, but not much. And we're, you know, we've lost about 20% of our funding over the last decade. So it's tough, very tough. Yeah, this was a question about our doc, which uh, it doesn't, I should spell that out. It's um, the research domain criteria. It's a, it's a project that the National, Institutes of Mental, National Institute of Mental Health is um, promoting, and it's a way of saying that uh, we need to rethink the way we do diagnosis for autism and, um, and, and actually for the range of disorders that are in the DSM-5 that DSM-5 is very useful for payers and for pro providers, but for researchers, it's simply no longer appropriate to base diagnosis only on behavioral signs and symptoms. We don't really do that in any other area of medicine. There's no reason to do it here. And so our doc, Research Domain Criteria, is an attempt to bring in other kinds of information from genomics, from imaging, from um, the history of childhood trauma, from social determinants and poverty, whatever that happens to be, to help fill out a much more complete picture of how we think about what should be the right classifiers and which of those classifiers may be most predictive of treatment response. So we're, we do think uh, today that, um, that the, the, the sort of fastest road to better therapeutics will be better diagnostics. And RDOC is one way to improve the diagnostics. Very good. Well, thank you very much.